this is the first uh, of six lectures that we'll be hosting on Fridays, 12 uh, to 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, so basically Boston time. Um, and I'd like to give the word to Zach, who's my PI, to um, yeah quickly um, yeah um, mention some things that are relevant uh, that might be relevant to you, uh, and then uh, we'll continue from there. Thanks, Vera, and yeah, super excited and thrilled that you're all here. Um, just want to mention a couple of things. The Media Lab is an institution at MIT. Um, we're a research center, and the Future Sketches group is particularly researching the intersection of art, design, and technology, and thinking about what tools will artists and designers be using in the future. I wanted to mention a couple of things. One is that we we're, it's a, a graduate program, and we will have a call for master's students, um, and that is happening this fall. So if you're interested, reach out. We will have an informal open house. Um, if you're curious to learn more about the program, um, we'll have an open house where you could hear from us and we'll talk about the application process. Um, there also is a call for, um, oh God, I can't remember the name. Vera can, Vera can pull it up. There is a call for- Transformative um, design. Transformative design. We have a faculty search happening right now at the Media Lab. Um, so if you know, um, you know, folks in your network, uh, academics, people, um, who might be interesting for this job call, you know, please, uh, we would love for you to forward it on, uh, Vera, uh, we'll paste the link in the chat. Um, and just to say again, you know, thanks so much for coming. I'm going to pass it over to Vera for introductions and just want to say, um, you know, super excited that we can go on this journey together. Yeah, me too. Uh, thanks, uh, Zach. And also thanks, the, like, thanks to the Media Lab that we get to organize these lecture series. It's really been like we've had one in the in the spring uh, about generative AI and artistic practice. Uh, and so this one is about computational typography, which is something I am really interested in. And I, I hope you are too. Um, so we'll have, as I said before, we'll have uh, basically six different lectures. Um, and we wanted to basically invite people that work um, with typography, but kind of explore the boundaries of the like traditional typography and uh, look at ways how to use computation uh, uh, to basically enhance typography or tools, uh, make it more accessible, uh, use AI. Um, so, and maybe also in some ways, like how uh, it can help to dem democratize like the type design process. So um, yeah, we're very excited uh, for today because we have uh, space type studio uh, with us today and uh, it's uh, uh, Kevin and Lynn uh, so you see them hopefully somewhere in the top of the screen here and they're an amazing studio uh, they basically do uh, work for themselves which can have like very different formats um, but it's always very typographic like very typographic um, and what I also really like about their practice on top of that, like on top of the computational type they do for projects is that they also host uh, type electives, which is a, a kind of a school and a community um, that uh, helps or like basically host workshops and uh, and other events uh, to make type more accessible and to uh, basically have sort of non-traditional type education. So um, I'm very excited to hear uh, more about their practice um and yeah i want to give the stage to you thank you thank you so much all right i will now share the screen there we go all right hello everyone uh thank you so much to um thank you so much to Vera for introducing us and such a such a nice generous introduction and uh of course uh thank you so much for uh for hosting us to the future sketches group uh Zach and everyone who is attending right now uh, we are very thankful that you are here uh this is uh Lynn and Kevin and we run the space hype studio here in Brooklyn uh New York City let me just uh okay great sorry zoom control moment all right. 
So we're sitting at the Space Type office here right now, and in here we do pretty much everything related to the art and craft of letter forms. I'm a type designer and calligrapher, Kevin is a full stack developer, and we're both educators and creative technologists. We aren't joking when we say we do pretty much everything when it comes to designing letter forms. Um, something that we could be working on in a given week is making something that is more uh, generative typography, such as what you're seeing right now, or we could be painting really large format murals, we could be making risograph zines, we could be designing custom typefaces, just really a wide range of things. And in this talk, we'll talk about the aspects that inform our practice and propel it forward. We like to think that we have a very circular approach when it comes to our practice. And we think of the two driving forces of our practice as the love that we have for our craft and community. We are really committed to making um, and refining our craft across all different types of mediums. And we are always really committed to nurturing and caring for our community. We're both teachers, we're learners, we're organizers and advocates of all different things that you'll hear about today. So let's dive into the craft portion of our practice. Before our focus on computational typography uh, happened, our practice was initially focused on what you might think of as the more traditional aspects of letter form design, such as typeface design, calligraphy, and lettering. Hello. Type design Hello. is what forms the backbone of our practice. For those of you that are not familiar with the term, I simply tell people that we make fonts. <laughs> I've been a professional type designer for almost a decade, which is kind of wild to think about uh, now, but I've made all these uh, different styles over time, uh, such as uh, some like ampersand is here that are super expressive and unique that is inspired by chunky early calligraphy and uh, something that might be a little bit more practical, uh, sans serif that you can see here, such as Felicet, inspired by the French cat that went into space. And one that is going to be released next week, so this is like the newest typeface uh, that we've been working on is monochromic right here. Uh, you're getting a sneak peek because it's not <laughs> it's not launching until next week, so it's a little bit of a yeah, you know, sneak peek that you can see just here. And if you're wondering if we just go and just invent the letter design out of thin air, the answer is no. A lot of the basis for what informs our work is calligraphy, which is the art of writing. The writing tool deeply influences the output of our forms. And uh, if you have uh, written letter forms with different kinds of calligraphic tools before, you'll realize that picking up a different writing tool can change the overall look and feel and structure of what you're writing, even though you might be starting off from a very similar place initially. And of course, calligraphy, calligraphy doesn't have to stay on paper like in the olden times. Um, the end result can often translate to a different medium or surface, such as a blanket that you can surround yourself when you're cold. Uh, you know, not so much right now when it's 99 degrees out here, but you know. Uh, we also do lettering, which is what you can think of as illustration, but with a focus on letter forms. Usually it happens on smaller scales, like for logos and covers and such, but Sometimes it happens 40 feet above the air. So here you can see me uh, in this little uh, you know, red circle over here, like that's, that's me 40 feet above the air. Um, and so sometimes this happens in uh, places where it's really large on wild surfaces. And it's, it's really funny how much you can't see when your work is too large. <laughs> so I always kind of laugh when, I, uh, when I'm painting these murals, it's, it's, it's an experience. Uh, this is probably the widest piece we've done in terms of murals. This is an indoor mural for a building that you might have guessed is on Broadway, <laughs> uh, filled with all the icons of Broadway. And here's our uh, tired but happy faces in between painting. So we're going back and forth between like sites and, you know, our, our desks here. And sometimes it's more smaller and more intimate, right, which is nicer uh, in terms of finishing off uh, the, the sweaty part of the job a little faster. And sometimes it's even smaller, just like this hand-drawn map um, uh, that I did a while ago. And uh, this is a personal project. And because we often get tired of doing just client work, of course, it has a lot of restrictions. So we do a lot of fun stuff for ourselves as well. And you can see uh, me with very nerdy jeweler's glasses because uh, when, it, when I got to the East Coast, it was very teeny tiny little letters. And I was like, I can't see with my bare eyes. <laughs> 
And now we'll take a look at the computational portion of our craft, which I assume you're here for. How it all started was really this desire to do something with the digital typefaces that we were creating. And as type designers, we spend so much time as so much hours, like days, months, like trying to plot the most perfect point and the perfect curve. And the output of it is always this like really teeny tiny like font file, which feels a little bit ambiguous and like a little black box. And so all, so a lot of our drive for this was trying to see what we could do with our typefaces uh, beyond just, you know, loading into a graphic program and typing it out. And so, you know, initially we were thinking about like, how, you know, what we what can we do with this in our spare time? What we what could we do to change those outlines to transform, to distort? What if they could collapse on itself? And uh, what if we did things that you were taught not to do in design school explicitly, like stretching them and do all these different kind of ways, distorting them? Um, and it's a, it's really freeing as uh, as a type designer who spends so much time trying to find the perfect way to draw something. Um, it's just a lot of having fun. Yeah, if you look at a lot of our computational work, uh, a lot of it is centered around this idea of transformation and animation and movement. Um, so these sketches are part of a series we did last year for 36 Days of Type. Um, and we really didn't have any sort of prompts for ourselves other than to make something computational using P5. And for us, with 36 days of sketches, uh, that meant looking for different ways to look at typography uh, and re-render them through a computer's lens. Uh, so we're using the computer to take these letter forms and break them down and piece them back together again. Uh, maybe we're introducing physics and playing with patterns and expressing the idea of typography through these very like digital processes. Um, and here's the full series, A to Z and zero to nine. Um, so we're just trying out different combinations of, again, repetition, transformation, interactivity, uh, and interpreting our letter forms as images or as points and curves on the screen and doing something interesting uh, with that raw data. Uh, a lot of particle systems, a lot of twisting and turning and reshaping. And Lynn and I have very different approaches to building and designing. Um, I come from a very technical process-oriented background. Uh, and as you saw, she comes from visual design. Uh, so we're always starting from different places and meandering towards that middle ground. Uh, another project that we did last year was a web tool called Vartype, uh, which is a generative playground for variable fonts. Uh, so there's a series of generative sketches and you could load in different variable fonts to create kinetic typographic animations. Uh, again, very motion heavy output. Uh, and this project was interesting for us uh, because obviously there's a lot of programmatic work being done to create these animations on the website. Uh, but a lot of the legwork is also being done by the variable font itself. Uh, so you can use the same exact sketch uh, with two different fonts and get completely different results. Um, and so now you can see uh, with variable fonts, this idea of transformation and kinetics is starting to make its way back into the design process. Uh, suddenly, the type designer has a lot more control over the parameters of their typeface uh, and the way that it's used and rendered onto the screen. Um, it really allows the type designer to consider the dynamics of their typeface uh, and it encourages this collaboration between type design and uh, the online usage and expression of it. Um, in the sketches, you can also see here the interactive component. Um, so we're always thinking about how we, as viewers or consumers, can engage with a typographic experience. Um, and how we can make a connection between the viewer and the message. And pushing it a little bit further, um, how can we build uh, full systems and tools that encourage typographic exploration? Uh, so with bar type, it was important for us that visitors could not only generate animations, uh, but fine tune them using the variable font parameters on the right side of the screen. Um, and we really want to lean into this idea of engagement and empowering others online to learn about and utilize type um, in a way that's not just static text on a screen, you know, writing something in a Google Doc uh, or creating a pre-rendered video, uh, but something that's really more fluid and malleable and something you can really personalize. Um, a lot of our self-driven self projects lead to client work. Uh, so some are direct translations of our sketches. Uh, these probably look very familiar to the 36 days of type sketches that you saw. Uh, this was a project we did with Panasonic that was aired on Japanese TV. Um, and then some projects uh, open up more space for experimentation and learning. Uh, so this is a project that we did with Existential in partnership with Pack Studio. Uh, so Existential is an LA production company 
And for their launch campaign, they wanted to build a typographic landing page related to the question, why are we here? Uh, so this idea and this question of a shared existence and how everything eventually turns into dust. Uh, so they really gave us free reign of that, that idea. And we wanted to build an experience that was uh, kind of digitally familiar, uh, but infused with that sense of kineticism and interactivity. Uh, so how can we create a computational tool where you're typing into a type uh, a text box, uh, but the letters are formed by all of these smaller particles? Uh, we wanted to make this input feel seamless, um, even though it's being rendered on the canvas. You know, there's essentially like a particle physics engine uh, running behind it. Uh, we wanted to make it feel very natural, as if you're just editing on normal normal text box. Um, and we also wanted to make sure we maintain all of the features of the typeface that we were using and all of the intentions behind it, uh, including things like uh, ligatures and, and other open type features. And with client work that exists on the web, uh, we're oftentimes not just building the final output, uh, but a full computational tool. So here's the underlying system, which supports different typefaces, animation styles, different rendering options, and particle components. Uh, so you can see here we're using different uh, characters or images for the particles, uh, including emojis. Um, so not much to say here, just really uh, find this video calming. Um, and then of course, bringing it back, uh, they wanted an animation that could be exported for Instagram. Uh, so we have this message uh, turning to and from dust. This was another interactive typographic project that we did for type electives. Um, which is an online school uh, that Vera mentioned, and we'll talk about more in detail later. Uh, so our friend uh, Juan Villanueva designed a custom typeface for the school with Lynn, uh, and we incorporated it into an ASCII-inspired landing page. Uh, so you can see here that people can interact with the type as if it's a physical object um, and have a, a bu bunch of fun and just add their love into the virtual space. Uh, and that ASCII system led directly to this opportunity, uh, which is the last computational project that I'll talk about. Uh, so it's a project that we did for a startup called Chalk. And the idea was to de design animations and accents for the website inspired by ASCII art. Uh, so again, our clients were very open with the product. Uh, they give us a lot of room for technical exploration and experimentation. Uh, and we were looking for something that felt very organic, something that portrayed this feeling of chaotic data being wrangled together and streamlined. Um, and this was the final outcome, which you can see on their website. Um, but if we take it back to the conceptual phase, to the very beginning, uh, we were really inspired by this movement of liquid acid, uh, these moments of explosiveness, followed by moments of calm. Um, some of these videos are very atmospheric, very fluid. Um, and so we thought, well, let's build a design system where we can actually bring in that movement from the videos and have them playing in the background and introduce that into our images. Um, so we're running on a shader, and we're starting off with some basic shape, like a cube. And we apply one part of the shader, which transforms it into ASCII. Um, and if you've written an ASCII shader, or really any shader before, uh, you know this is its own adventure that I won't get into. Um, but now you start introducing those liquid acid videos um, as displacement maps, and suddenly you have something very interesting going on. Uh, something that was very compressed, very rigid, uh, now has curvatures, it has movement, um, it has more of a spark of life in it. Here it is zoomed out. Um, and now that we have this pipeline, what if we have a different type of input? Uh, so here we have animated noise maps, which still feels organic in some ways, uh, almost like a petri dish, uh, but we have sharper edges and the imagery is more clearly computer generated. What does it look like uh, applied to different images and cubes, right? So suddenly with a single system uh, and tool that we've built, uh, we're able to generate these very cohesive yet distinct sets of animations uh, that are all driven by the underlying videos. Um, and finally, what if we're not just uh, distorting a cube? Uh, what if we're using typography instead? Um, so what does it look like to distort type in this way? Um, here you can see the artifacts from the liquid acid video showing up in the way the typography is rendered, the way the liquid bubbles and boils over within the shapes of the letter forms, uh, and starts to create these very fluid movements, uh, almost like we've dropped some ink into a pond. Here it is with the ASCII filter applied. Uh, so 
in a sense, we're kind of drawing type with type uh, and so on, right? So it's this continuous process of being inspired by the analog images and analog ideas we're seeing in the world um, and bringing that back into our computational practice um, that could otherwise maybe feel a bit rigid. Um, and we're not using the computer to create a specific animation or a specific sequence. Uh, we're really focused on building tools and systems that allow your work to be flexible um, and more reactive and more interactive. Um, and I think it allows your work to evolve in a way you wouldn't expect. Uh, it gives this computer space to play, um, and it can surprise you with you know what it comes up with. And what was once computational always finds its way into all the other letter form related work that we do. Uh, we're always going back and forth between all these different disciplines and mediums since we're not like only, you know, like work isn't happening in terms of like being in siloed buckets. We're always like do, you know, we always have multiple things going uh, back and forth. So there's a lot of like cross pollination that happens. And, and so this is where like we think about the circularity of our work. Uh, so this is an example when um, I wanted to uh, do something very calligraphic for an exhibition that we had in November of last year up in Skidmore College in upstate New York. And uh, I was really inspired to write like unconventional lines, being really inspired by the uh, the, the melty ASCII graphics that you have just seen. Um, and so you can kind of imagine like the idea of movement, fluidity, maybe you can kind of see how I started to write letters in this way in terms of calligraphy as well. And so, you know, calligraphy for me is like a process where I just write over and over, iterating on different kinds of different forms until I get to the one that feels right. And then again, uh, it's always nice to see these uh, very larger scale than what I wrote them in. Um, so this is, uh, this is, I think, about 80 inches tall uh, being printed in a jackward uh, woven tapestry. And it's also nice when you have a mural indoors with a very smooth surface. And so also for this exhibition, we were also channeling that idea of expressive calligraphy, uh, just, you know, freestyling on the wall uh, for this exhibition. And so there's double, it's double sided. So you can see the other side right here. And so here you can see here that it's the larger format, but it's still very much calligraphy in the chant, in the sense where it's one line, one stroke with one brush. And of course, being a type designer, I can't resist making it into a typeface. So I made it into a typeface and of course um, had to print it in like nice shimmery gold ink on a print. And it doesn't stop at just uh, Latin letter forms either. Uh, here is a Hangul mural in the Seaport District in New York City that we painted back in April, I believe, um, for You Are Not Alone mural series. It is a mural series that promotes mental health awareness. And it says, Donun Honza Ga Anya. Uh, the Korean translation for you're not alone. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a native Korean, so there's that connection as well. And of course, it's always nice to, you know, do physical things that involve an excuse to, you know, ask your friends to help out, of course, uh, sit in the sun for a little bit. And then we also run a publishing practice. This is, I think, uh, the newest part of our practice that focuses on self-published scenes and prints that we print uh, by Risso right from our Brooklyn studio. I'm right sitting right next to the, the giant printer. It's a lot of fun to escape our uh, desks once in a while and be at conventions and book fairs. And it allows us to meet all different kinds of people and to also just utilize all these different things that we do in, in the studio into printed ephemera. So we might be making fun pieces of lettering to express ourselves. We might be sitting here with knives and glue, hand binding these uh, zines, sometimes wondering why we decided to buy, you know, make zines, but you know, it's for the soul, it's for the soul. <laughs> and sometimes we even make uh, you know, fun, just really, really fun things such as an entirely fictional Teen Cat magazine here, all about uh, kitty pop stars inspired by magazines of my childhood. And this is one where we got to use a lot of the different typefaces that we made at the studio just because the aesthetic allows for it. And also it was a great excuse to commission friends for cat illustrations uh, such as these here. You can see Percy and Claudio and all these different um, fun, fun cat bands. And uh, Kevin wrote this entire thing too. So there's, there's a little bit, there's a lot of things going on really. And of course, uh, computational sketches make their way into our uh, Risso printing pr uh, practice as well. So you can see uh, this piece. 
And then you can also see this breathe peat being translated into a printed format that you can see here on the right side. It's really interesting trying to capture a still snapshot from our animated uh, generative pieces as well. It's very interesting. And uh, we also couldn't resist trying to make like other things. So we made scarves in the middle of summer, no less. And it's very gratifying to see friends wearing them. Um, uh, if you couldn't tell, like on the left-hand side, that black and white scarf says A, A B, C, D, E, F, G all throughout. Uh, sometimes pe people take them and they're like, what does it say? I actually don't know. And they're like, well, it's A through Z. <laughs> and then here on the right-hand side, you can see uh, Moop wearing a pixel scarf, uh, which is also another one of the things that we do here as well. And that's a lot about our craft and the things that we love making. But equally important are our focus on communities and our commitment to caring and sharing with the people around us. Yeah, so Lynn and I started collaborating uh, by teaching together uh, even before we officially started Space Type in 2019. Uh, so education is at the center of our practice. Uh, we've led a lot of workshops and semester long courses at institutions like the Cooper Union, Matterform Archive, and Parsons the New School. Uh, and we also do a lot of talks at conferences all over the country and internationally. Um, and since the beginning, uh, once we when we teach uh, computational typography, uh, we've built using P5GS. Uh, it's really important for us to teach in an environment that is accessible and encourages collaboration. And the entire ecosystem around P5 is really built around community, around documentation and access. Uh, you don't need to download or install anything. Um, they have a whole system built out uh, to make sure the error messages are super friendly. Um, and it's easy to share and duplicate sketches in the online editor, uh, which is really important in a classroom for being collectively present with each other's work, uh, seeing each other's underlying code, and being able to support and debug each other's issues. Uh, and we've been really fortunate to have met students from all over the world, uh, having uh, taught pretty much always online, uh, some of whom stay up at four in the morning to join our calls. Uh, so thank you. Uh, to everyone internationally. Uh, we get all different types of people, designers, software engineers, uh, undergrad students, and tenured faculty. Uh, so it's been really interesting to see people from so many different backgrounds uh, trying to learn more about computation uh, or learn more about typography and bringing those ideas back into their own practice. Um, I think it's really a testament to tooling communities like P5 uh, that so many different types of people are now thinking about computation and it's just another part of their toolkit in designing and creating. Um, we've had several teachers take our courses uh, just because their own students are designing computationally or they're building websites for their work. Um, and I think it's really because of this, you know, kind of somewhat recent proliferation of online tools that are future rich, uh, but still focused on being welcoming and beginner friendly. Uh, if you want to see our, some of our students' work, uh, you can visit these pages and give them a shout out on social. And all of our older course materials are open source on GitHub. Uh, so you can see full syllabi for our 10 week generative type classes, as well as our shorter workshops on topics like glitch art or variable fonts. Um, and you'll be able to see things like all of the exercises we assign to our students, all of our sketch collections, uh, recorded lectures. Uh, along with references, readings, books, and other resources related to uh, generative art and typography. Uh, we've also built resources specifically for type design as well. Uh, so Lynn has a website called typedesignschool.com. And on there, you can see over 10 hours of recorded lectures and demos uh, covering what Lynn would usually teach over a 15 week semester in type design. Um, and all of the videos there are free. They're fully online uh, for anyone to watch and to learn. Way, way too many hours of me just talking at you okay. but if you're yeah if you're driven <laughs> um and um I can't believe this uh, only launched in January of this year, but it feels like such a big part of our practice now. Uh, so here's type electives again that we started talking about a little bit earlier in terms of design. Um, this is an online uh, type and design school that we launched with our friend Juan Villanueva. And the type electives mission is to form a more inclusive and equitable feature in type and design. And the way that we try to do that is by first increasing accessibility to all these types of specialized education and also creating a thoughtful space to shape uh, the discord around all of this, uh, to talk about type as culture and industry and everything else that surrounds it. We 
uh, we are in our third semester. So we had our spring, um, spring, summer, and now we're in our fall semester. And we're always really thankful to all our faculty. It's a really diverse community of people who approach their practice from a place of uh, respect, responsibility, criticality, and most of all, love. And uh, giving out scholarships is a big part of our efforts for access parity as well. So we really try to give out as much as we can. Um, this is a BIPOC scholarship. And so far we've given out 40 individual scholarship awards spread out amongst the 14 classes that we've run. So uh, percentage wise, that's almost a, a 37 percentage of students getting some form of scholarship. And the, the ratio, um, uh, kind of varies from 25% to 100%, but the median is about 70% of the tuition, which is actually very impressive. I was I, I was doing the numbers while I was preparing for this lecture and we're like, wow, um, you know, like we just started in January. And so like, we're, we're just on the ground trying really hard, you know, trying, you know, the whole grassroots um, bootstrapping things, but, you know, we're always really uh, thankful for how much we can do with our donations and everyone that helps out and so on and so forth. Uh, very exciting times. And although this initially started out as an online initiative, uh, we started getting venues donated around the city. And so we started putting on free workshops and events and all of our in-person workshops um, are free and run by volunteers. We've uh, hosted events at a variety of different places, including a local coffee shop around the block here, uh, about like 50 people. You can see photos from our death metal lettering workshop. It's, uh, uh, you know, like it was very fun. The classic uh, Brooklyn warehouse style, no AC, run, powered by, uh, you know, just fans, uh, but still having fun. And we've also hosted events at a larger event space here as well with more than, um, uh, you know, like 150 people. And of course, like something like this takes on, uh, you know, uh, takes a lot of volunteers and just a lot of people just like um, sharing their wealth of knowledge with us. And so we're always like really, you know, just lots of gratitude all around. And alongside cultivating our aligned communities and uh, type electives, uh, trying to care for the hyper local communities around us is also uh, one of the big things that we value. And as we started to ease out of the pandemic last year, we started a small collective design space in Gowanus, which is exactly where we're sitting right now. And uh, it's no fun if it's just the two of us in like an empty room. <laughs> so no matter how nice it is. <laughs> so uh, today we rent out desks to four other designers. We're all from very different backgrounds at different stages of our lives. And it's really blossomed into a cooperative workshop, informal mentorship, and, you know, really just a nice gathering of friends. A, a lot of things uh, bleed in, again, that circularity that is like prevalent through our practice where we collaborate together on design projects, we uh, teach and help each other teach, organize community events together, um, and we just like broaden each other's perspectives on a near daily basis. And that's how the craft and community pillars come together. So hopefully you've seen a range of water practices about. There's a lot of variety in here, both in terms of medium, tools, output, um, the literal things on what we are doing. And uh, as I have to say, though, just because there's just like so much going on for us all the time, uh, something that we constantly think about is uh, what is the point of all of this? How do we tie everything in together? There's so many different aspects of our craft and what really drives us. And what we always keep coming back to is our desire to stay curious, um, to be curious with other folks, uh, to be curious about different mediums and different tools, and just to be, you know, just to be in it together, whether they be collaborators, clients, or students. And I feel that uh, there is this pressure sometimes um, in society and also in our field uh, that like we have to be on this sort of linear path of uh, having a specialization where like you start off uh, smaller or as a novice and then you follow this like linear path towards like becoming an expert, becoming a specialization, just just growing in a linear path. Um, and it, this this model we uh, doesn't really work for us uh, specifically because like we have a lot of multiple dimensions. Like some people only know us for our computational work. Some people only know us for our typeface design work, uh, so on and so forth. And so uh, sometimes when you feel like we're faltering in our path and our commitment to our practice, we like to envision our, ourselves on a circular path um, 
just like the Native American medicine wheel. And this wheel, if I if I may condense it in a in a short sentence, it represents integrative learning, um, and it sets up a foundation for lifelong learning in the sense where there is a circular directionality. Uh, and in this uh, specific example here, it might start with anticipation, and then curiosity would drive you all the way into a, po a point where you could introspect. And at that point, you could integrate it back into your larger uh, life and practice, and then you could come back to the start again. And this medicine wheel is very great at like portraying how uh, the cycle of learning um, and going through uh, your, you know, just like kind of stacking up your expertise as a recurrent process. And if we think about this wheel as a dimensional thing, as opposed to just a 2D thing flat down, uh, you can think about this as a spiraling climb. And uh, this this framework allows us to imagine ourselves going through these stages of being a novice to an expert uh, whenever we tackle new uh, mediums, tools, uh, different, you know, different aspects of all these different things. And then it allows us to be fearless in like starting over again with something new again, while acknowledging that we are going somewhere as opposed to just like, you know, starting back at the bottom of the totem pole. Um, and and we also like to imagine that like we exist within a larger a set of a spiral where there's uh, us too, but also a lot of folks around us, uh, the communities around us, other people, you know, peers, collaborators, students and such like being on this journey together. And, you know, it's never fun to be doing something in a lonely silo. And so uh, we always hope that by cultivating and nurturing the communities around us and also trying to keep at it, uh, being inspired by others to, you know, keep being at it, uh, that we're, you know, always on this path together, you know, just, just trying to at least. That's the aspiration anyhow. And so thank you all so much for tuning in. And please let us know if you have any questions. We're very happy to be an open book. Thank you. Everyone give a big applause. You can also like put a uh... You know, there's like an emoji you can click if you don't want to unmute, that also works. Wow, that was so amazing. Thank you so much, Lynn and Kevin, for this. Uh, this is really awesome. Um, so we have a Q&A uh, as well, and I, I already saw a lot of questions, but if you are in this uh, in this call and you have any questions, please post them in the chat. Um, I'll briefly do a few householding things before we uh, do the Q&A, so it will also give you some time to post uh, any questions you might have. Uh, so first and foremost, I want to thank you both for uh, this talk. This was really, it's really inspiring and it's just really uh, also kind of wholesome to hear you talk about this, if, yeah, if that makes sense. Uh, it just makes me feel really happy um, to see sort of the collaboration of type and, and, um, and, and code uh, and calligraphy as well. Um, I also really want to give a, a big shout out to our ASL interpreter, Blair Fell. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot that in the beginning, but it's so great to have you here. Um, and yeah, um, it's really, really nice. And um, also Blair will be with us for the rest of this series. Uh, so if you don't know, um, if you don't know yet, we'll uh, have uh, for five more weeks after this, we'll have, uh, we'll have a talk every Friday at this time. So we'll have uh, Jus van Rossum, Talia Cotton, Peter Cho, uh, Beatrice Lozano, and Dia Studio with us, which will also be awesome. Also, all of this is recorded. So this talk is recorded. If you joined a bit later, we'll post it uh, after the event is over. Um, and we'll also record the other talks. Um, and then there's two more uh, short things. So um, the group that we're in, Future sketches. They'll have a call for. Uh, we'll have a call for students. So if you want to join, uh, there's an open house you can sign up for, and we'll also host a smaller open house for them. And there's an open call for a uh, professorship with tenure track um, at uh, at Media Lab. It's for transformative design. So I'll I'll post those links again. So that should have given you enough time for questions uh, for writing them up. Um, I saw one question that Zach had, which was um, basically um, about tools. So uh, we've seen you use a couple of tools, but uh, we'd be really curious to hear uh, what your favorite tools are specifically. So both maybe analog and coding related. And also if there's any tools that you wish, wish existed that 
don't really exist right now. Tools. I I feel like we are a little bit agnostic when it comes to languages and tools, but I think we have recently been working a lot in P5 just because that is a primary tool that we teach with. And so like it is easier for us to be working in P5 all the time, although we know it's not like the most um, performant at times. But I mean, Kevin, do you have a do you have a particular other favorite, rising favorite? I feel like there's a lot of tools that are always coming and going and um, you know, people are always building, you know, there's, you know, things like cavalry and L for mm. you know creative coding. And uh I feel like part of why I appreciate that type of like is is also around is that we're you know trying to make space for people to teach that type type of thing. Uh mm. Beatrice Bolano, uh, we we had teach an AR type class. Uh and we, yeah. we don't really do too much AR. So I'm like, oh okay, well maybe we should learn AR and like learn Spark or AR, AR kit and, and all those things. Um so, so you also learn from uh, <laughs> offering these courses in a way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, we set it up for ourselves, really. Yeah. Uh, what yeah. do we want to learn? Yeah, exactly. 3D, <laughs> 3D really nice. stuff, 3 js you know. Yeah. Uh, Spline yeah. is like an online tool that you can use for, for 3D um, editing and design. So yeah, I feel like there's more tools than, you know, we know how to like focus on. And uh, mm. there's always like this is we, we want to learn uh, that we haven't gotten to yet. Yeah, that's also great uh, that in that way, like type electives, like you say, it's like a sort of way to keep learning. That was also something I really liked in your talk. And Chelsea also had a, a question about that. Um, so um, she wondered what it's what it was like for you to start type electives and kind of build a community around type and computation, like how that process was for you. Oh, that's a great question. I think... Uh, the idea of having some kind of school had been around for a long time um, between myself and Juan, because we have been teaching for such a long time at all these different institutions around the city. And just because we spend so much time teaching, but sometimes like we are a little bit like frustrated with the prescriptive ways that we had to mold ourselves into what institutions needed as opposed to being able to think of um, think of like teaching holistically I think like we had always kind of like thrown around about this idea I think what really came um, what really became the driving force that like actually forced us to uh, create this was the pandemic when a lot of the classes did go online and then so like we pivot and um, Kevin is uh, uh, us, us too as well like we were pivoting a lot to how can we teach effectively online on as opposed to like being kind of split between online or in person and I think in that process we we were like okay like actually this is a really great opportunity for us to expand our reach uh, beyond just New York City because a lot of what we learn uh, is because we are privileged enough to be in New York City but what about the people that don't have access or can't, uh, don't have access to uh, being in the States or like have the privilege to sort of like travel somewhere and be able to foot the bill uh, for learning in um, more urban places for, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Nice. That's, that's great. It's good to hear something good came out of the pandemic in, in that sense that it sort <laughs> of helped you build or like materialize that community for further. Um. Yeah, so there's also a, a question that I uh, from Char that I really liked, which was a little bit more about uh, sort of the typographic uh, background in your work. So also, like you said, Lynn, you have a background in calligraphy and that I think really shows, which uh, is very beautiful. It doesn't really like you somehow manage to keep that quality to it, even when you uh, work in a digital realm. Um, and Char's question is, um, so basically, the standardization, like standardization of uh, standardization of type, is kind of one of the oldest uh, standards in design that uh, I think we have. Um, so, what do you have? Like any favorite artifacts uh, from like history of type that uh, that sort of comes back in your work? Um, maybe you know we saw it in the um, yeah. Is there like any artifact that? do you find interesting or that you refer to a lot yeah I, I hi char um that that's like 
That's a great question. I think I just also really love learning about the history of all of this. Um, and so I do have uh, on the type typedesignschool.com, uh, I also do have like a six part lecture series on the history of Latin uh, letters. And so it fascinates me how many styles like rise and fall with time. And so like, we can kind of like imagine like, uh, we can, we can, if we just look back in history, people have had enough time, uh, uh, you know, in about like 2000 years plus to sort of do wild things and for it to be forgotten and for people to do new things again, thinking that they're doing wild things, but actually someone has already done them before. Uh, right. So I, I mean, I would say that I really love if I had to pick one moment in time, like it would be the period right before the Carolingian reform that happened with the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne around like the 800s. So that's when like, the, so the Carolingian reform is where we get a lot of conventions for our Roman, uh, you know, like our Latin uh, conventions, like the idea that there's a capital letter, a sentence and a period, and like the the idea that there's like a standardized like a sender, x height, and all of those things, like it became neatly packaged into a, a guideline, right? Um, but bef so right before then, that also means there was not really anything of that happening. So there's a lot of like weird things that are happening. Um, and so like for me, that is where I find so much joy, um, although probably not very helpful if you're learning, you know, formal, proper uh, type design. But, you know, that's so there's things I learn and there's things I love. Right. So two different things. <laughs> nice. I mean, these things can also indirectly influence your work right so it's really nice to hear uh to hear about that um there's also some uh questions about basically the way you collaborate as a studio or how you work as a studio um so for instance alejandro uh sorry if i don't pronounce your name right uh, but alejandro asks um often um or uh wait uh what's your favorite or wh what is your criteria to decide how much time you spend working on personal projects versus client projects so that's maybe also like the personal interest versus the the thing you actually uh use in your type uh, practice um and is it like a something that you uh work on at the same time or do you block time for it a million dollar question <laughs> oh gosh you want to take no. this one? I don't know if I have an answer for that. I think that we, it's always, you know, when you're working on your own studio and you're trying to balance those two, it's, um, it's always a kind of ebb and flow. Sometimes it's just natural that you have less client projects, so you have more space to kind of think about what you want to do personally um, and explore those concepts. Um, and sometimes also, you know, we showed a couple of projects where we had client work, but it was also like very freeing in terms of um, how much space we had to experiment uh, from like a design perspective and a technical perspective. Uh, so those are kind of like the million dollar projects, right? Where you're excited to work on it and you can learn something new in the process. Uh, so those kind of come by and you're like, okay, we'll, we'll put in a lot of time into this and um, a lot of that ratio kind of shifts. Um, and then the resource stuff, like, you know, that was something new this year that we ended up spending a lot more time on than we expected uh, because it, we took a course um, and then we fell in love with it and we ended up like kind of falling into like the Riso community in New York City. Um, so it's kind of these surprises and uh, the, it, part of it is like the community aspects and uh, also like the, the clients you meet. Uh, sometimes they, they kind of uh, align with what you're interested in. So I don't mm -hmm. know if you have like... Yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe so maybe one one fun thing to point out is that both of us learn as a both of us take classes and learn yeah. things as a hobby. And I think that is like a, a, a something that we think of as nurturing our personal time and not working, but ends up kind of like turning into like something that we end up working in. So it's like a weird, weird boundary thing. Uh, I mean, like uh, I fell into uh, the computational side of my practice when I attended uh, the School for Poetic Computation back in 2018, uh, the summer session organized by Melanie Hoff and Taeyun Choi, and the fall session organized by your very own Zach uh, and uh, Taeyun Choi and La uh, Lauren Gardner. And um, it, I mean, like, it is a privilege to be able to, that, that's, a, that's a New York City privilege, right? We're like, okay, like, that seems really interesting and cool. I'm going to go and learn this new thing. And I was like, wow, like, this is really cool. And then eventually, like, 
you know, like that is something that I was able to encounter because I'm here and was able to encounter all these amazing people. And uh, now, now look at us uh, making more computational things uh, way after the immersive has ended. Um, uh, and so, I mean, that's one thing that I never thought was part of work, right? Or like something that I took as something that I was thought I was going to be become a professional in, yeah. right? Um, so I guess the the boundary between personal and professional is a little bit blurred in that sense where the personal work of today might be the professional work yeah. of three years from now, maybe? Yeah, exactly. uh, yeah. Uh, I think a lot of the, you know, we show like 36 Days of Type, which became the Panasonic uh, client job. And then the type of stuff, we kind of like kickstarted on our own and we made a fun animation and that immediately like led to more work of chalk um oh so yeah that's right it's kind of like yeah it is circular if you just put your work out there and you're, you're looking to learn and like um you know be part of the community and like share uh people will notice and people will be interested in what you have to to give yeah nice. I mean calligraphy totally started as like my escapism like I was like I want to do something with my hands that is like not at the computer and then lo and behold it's like oh I'll do calligraphy jobs uh, like yeah yeah nice it's interesting to see or to hear in your answer that there's so much uh it's really formed around community so uh with the workshops or like the courses you follow and then also the 36 days of type is i mean it's online but it's also a sort of community sharing uh project so that might also be a sort of interesting thing to take away that the community is then also really important for you in making personal work that then somehow becomes uh, professional work yeah. uh, that's really great to see um, there's a question by Antonina um, which is more about sort of pointers uh, so she uh, or they say uh, often coding process uh, don't really seem playful do you have any advice on how to stay creative and whimsical do, uh, when you do computational graphics hmm. that's a good question I think what we always teach in, you know, the first class of our like more computational courses is to like embrace failure and like, you know, when you're coding, even, you know, I've been coding for over a decade and uh, you always start off with like just a bunch of like errors and things just don't work the way that you expect it to. Um, but we try and embrace that and we try and uh, encourage people to just play around with that code and see, you know, change different parts of it to see like what the computer will give you. I think it's more of a like a collaboration between you and the computer uh, when you're coding. Um, and if you give this computer like some space to to play, then it'll give you like some more inspiration and like motivation to um, continue making. I don't know if that made sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, think it does. I mean, I think Kevin, I feel like, I, I feel like uh, some people have never just had trouble coding. Like it's just like comes naturally to them. And I think Kevin is one of them. And like, uh, you know, as, as someone who struggled with like high school math, yeah. um, it took me a long time to get familiar. And I think for me, it's like the idea of setting aside time, like a little bit um, every day to d be doing something and then walking away allows me to be more whimsical in terms of like, you know what, if I waste 30 minutes of today, like what, what is that worth? Uh, you know, not, not too much in the grand scheme of my life. Um, and so I think that allows me to be less precious. Uh, of course it's sometimes you don't have the luxury when you're doing client work, when it just needs to work and it needs to get shipped. Uh, but when we do have that luxury, um, I, I advocate for little bits at a time approach. Yeah. I, I think we do a lot of like little bits and little sketches uh, that take, you know, 20, 30 minutes. And it's not until a couple months later that we like look at it and we're like, oh, that's cool. And we kind of like continue building on top of it. So yeah. it's this very like long tail of creating and being inspired by things that you thought was just, you know, junk uh, <laughs> a couple months ago. That's right. So. Nice. Thank you so much. Um, the, I think a final question um so we're almost or we're kind of out of time is uh um do you have any type electives planned ah, in the future yeah well i mean plans are happening all the time <laughs> <laughs> um we, we need more hands for them but i the, any upcoming stuff 
Uh, there's a new fall series lecture that's uh, that's starting next week as well. Nice. Uh, that is online. And if you're local, we have a ooh, we haven't announced this yet, but it is sort of semi-public now, um, on September 29th, I believe. So the last uh, Friday of September uh, at Principal's GI Coffee House here in Gowanus, we're also running another free workshop where we'll be designing uh, manhole covers. So if you're wow. interested in manhole covers, you can come draw some manhole covers with us. And you know we'll see if we're freezing or sweating together. That's the that's the nature of the, work, the warehouse uh, vibe, right? But yeah. That sounds amazing. Thank you. Uh, I posted the um, the type electives link, so I think people can follow that to see if there's any other things happening. And I just want to thank you so much, Lynn and Kevin, uh, for this amazing, uh, amazing, super inspirational uh, talk and all the open uh, answers you gave. Also, thanks to Blair for uh, translating. Uh, and thanks to everyone in the Media Lab and spe like specifically Zach uh, for making this happen. Uh, so uh, you're, that's it. We'll record it. Sorry if we, we didn't get to answer your question. Um, but we'll be back next week, Friday, uh, with the next talk by Just Van Rossum. Yeah.